Hi, my name is Nathan Webb. Uh, I'm in the uh, Space Resources Program here at the Colorado School of Mines, and I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about uh, the future of settling off uh, human settlements off planet for the next 20 years or so. So currently, we um, the only off planet settlement that we have is the International Space Station. We began construction on it in 1998, and it has actually been continuously crewed since 2000. So humanity has had a presence in space for 20 years straight at this point, which is pretty exciting. But we also haven't uh, expanded that capacity at all uh, since we launched the International Space Station. However, uh, in the next 10 to 20 years, that's going to be changing pretty dramatically. And the reason for this is that the space industry is at an inflection point. Uh, launch costs are being driven down by uh, private companies like SpaceX um, and competitors that have been inspired to join this market um, by SpaceX and others, and as well as an increase in spaceflight activity by private companies um, that want to engage in a very cost-effective manner in space. Uh, so traditionally, you've got your communication satellites, uh, things that bring you, you know, your direct TV or your internet, and then you've got government, and that makes up a large portion of the current uh, satellite fleet. Uh, however, we've seen a lot of small operators launch things like CubeSats um, for research, and even uh, at least one company is delivering up to uh, high quality imagery of Earth in a time effective manner. Um, and uh, we're seeing a lot of development uh, from these companies, and this has the potential to reach a critical mass really soon where we see a massive growth in this sector. Um, for example, the, uh, every one of these is a settlement that has been proposed to uh, come into operation by 2040. So we've got the International Space Station, which is already launched and in operation. It will continue operation for uh, quite some time. It's expected to last until about 2030 before it needs uh, major renovation. Uh, at which point it'll probably just be uh, replaced with something else. Uh, but then we've also got the uh, Chinese, we've got uh, stations from China, we've got stations from uh, Russia, uh, we've got a similar station from ISRO, that's the Indian Space Agency. Um, and then we've got a lot of private operators that wanna build stuff too. So um, private stations that will look and feel very similar to the International Space Station include uh, the B330 Nautilus from Big Low Aerospace. Um, Blue Origin wants to launch a space station by 2030. Um, Axiom uh, Space is, intends to launch a space hotel uh, by 20. Uh, they're going to start construction on that in a couple of years. And Sierra Nevada Corporation actually just last month announced plans to um, start building an inflatable space station of their own. So in addition to that, we've got slightly more ambitious goals. Uh, so Voyager Station is going to be a, um, instead of a typical you know, zero gravity environment like the International Space Station, Voyager Station uh, announced by Orbital Assembly Corporation earlier this year, um, is supposed to be an actual rotary station that will uh, think of your typical sci-fi movie space station where you've got uh, a large wheel connected by spokes that rotates to simulate gravity. It's also supposed to be a fairly large station with a crew of up to 400, or with capacity for up to 440 uh, occupants which is absolutely massive compared to everything else on this list. We've also got the Artemis program, which uh, aims to set up a sustained human presence on the moon by um, 2030. And then we've got uh, an additional uh, Chinese and Russian settlement for the moon aimed sometime after 2030. 
And then we, of course, have SpaceX. SpaceX is fairly well known. Um, Elon Musk has stated that he wants to put a million people on Mars by the year 2050. Uh, and the way that they aim to do this is by dramatically altering the equation for uh, space launch. Traditionally, we have these large rockets, they get thrown away in the ocean after every use. Um, but currently, SpaceX is building their uh, Starship. Um, it's currently, uh, they're currently testing prototypes in Boca Chica, so this is not just a paper rocket that will never see the light of day. Uh, and they are aiming, uh, the idea is that if you reuse the rocket and you don't throw a whole bunch of it away every single time, um, you can get the cost of launch down to, um, they're aiming to shoot anywhere from two to five million dollars. For context, their Falcon 9 rocket is currently one of the cheapest rides to space, and it costs $50 million uh, to launch on a partially reused vehicle. So this is going to be a major disruption to the launch services sector um, and is the only way that they're going to achieve anywhere close to the goal of a large colony on Mars by 2050. So the goal of this study is to understand how the population for off-planet settlements will evolve over the next 20 years, and also try and understand a little bit about how uh, early space settlements will affect the market for launch services. Um, so what I do is I measure the, uh, I look at the current population and the current market size every five years until 2040. So starting, it starts in 2025, I look at how many people are in orbit and how many, um, and what the launch infrastructure is going to require to, uh, the, what the, what kind of launch cadence and price we're going to need to um, supply them and get them to orbit. Um, and then I do that again in 2030, 2035 and 2040. I also do this analysis three times, once in an optimistic scenario, once in a neutral scenario, and once in a pessimistic scenario. For the optimistic scenario, uh, this is your best case scenario. Uh, the only rule is that the program sponsor can't currently be defunct. There have been quite a few companies that have uh, come in and out of existence that want to put some kind of habitat into orbit. Um, so everyone on this list is currently still in business in one way or another, and they have to have announced uh, they have to have announced what they're doing. So we're going to launch a station that houses six people, and they have to tell tell us when. Uh, so we're going to do that by 2030. Uh, otherwise, there's just not enough data to include it in the study, uh, and and then I try to account for. Uh, program delays and cost overruns. Um, these are fairly common in the space sector. So for a neutral scenario, a program sponsor must have a minimum of a million dollars in funding. So it has to be a fairly decently well-backed operation. Um, I push back the start date of all the programs by five years. Um, and SpaceX, which I'll get a little bit, I'll get into the how I calculate their development in uh, the next slide, but they only achieve, in addition to being delayed five years, they also only achieve half of what where they need to be to um, establish a sustainable colony. Uh, in the, and then in the pessimistic scenario, um, this, this is, these are only the programs that are most likely to succeed. So the program must be backed by a significant amount of money, $500 million. Uh, they also experience a delay of 10 years and SpaceX, in addition to the 10 year delay, only achieves 25% of what it would need to be. Um, so for SpaceX, I developed an exponential function in Wolfram Alpha uh, to determine uh, from where there's, we know that they're going to start in roughly 2028 and we know that they're going to um, need to grow exponentially to land a million people on Mars by 20, um, 
2050. So I use an, I developed an exponential function using well from alpha to figure out how to get them at least close to that goal. And then I um, take the value of that curve over time and 20 and each sampling period um, to determine what population they would need to have to hit their goal. And then our results, this is the optimistic scenario. So we can see a very rapid, very dramatic increase in population across um, all three locations. So in low Earth orbit, uh, we're currently at a population of about seven to 10 people with the ISS. By 2020, as soon as 2025, we could have 25 people in low Earth orbit. And then with that massive Voyager station from uh, orbital assembly, that could grow to over 500 people by 2030. Uh, on the moon, uh, we've got um, the government stations coming online in, 20, uh, in 2024. And then another station comes online in 2035. And then SpaceX, you really see that exponential growth where they go from ha not having landed anyone in 2025 to over 23,000 people by 2040. Um, interesting artifact of um, SpaceX having, or uh, Starship being so cheap to launch is that it doesn't actually begin to, uh, it brings the cost of launch so cheap that it doesn't nece uh, necessarily affect the size of the market. Uh, until you start launching literally thousands of people in 2040. Uh, other than that, the uh, curve remains relatively flat across the rest of the experiment. Uh, in the neutral scenario, we do see a little bit, um, we, we see that five-year delay, but then again in 2035, orbital assembly launches their Voyager station, we see a massive uptick tick in the population of LEO. Um, the moon continues to grow, and then, of course, SpaceX has been delayed five years, but they've already got almost 3,000 people on Mars by 2040. Um, this provides a more um, uh, this provides a more steady growth pattern, but you do see it cap off at the same uh, similar levels to the optimistic scenario by 2035. And we'll get to what's going on here uh, towards the end. And then the pessimistic scenario. This is probably, if you ask most people, um, what is likely to happen. Here we see not we don't see any growth in low Earth orbit until 2035. And then we start to see a little bit of growth in uh, 2040. This is because uh, orbital assembly did not meet the criteria for this uh, scenario. And um, actually all but two of our private operators did not meet the criteria for this. So uh, we see a very limited amount of growth in low Earth orbit. Uh, but still, 33 people is more than we've ever had on orbit at once. Wow. So that'll be exciting to see. And then on the moon, uh, mostly just due to program delays, Artemis doesn't get started until 2035. Um, and the Chinese and Russian program doesn't actually happen until after the end of this program. And then SpaceX, um, having been delayed now 10 years and only achieving 25% of their goal, uh, only manages to land, to land 150 people on Mars by the end of 2040. And as you can see, uh, this is reflected in the total market size, very limited growth up until 2035, and then um, it, grow, it finally matures in 2040. So this, um, while this is a reasonable possibility space for what could happen, uh, I'd really like to drill down and get a data-driven approach this time. This has been mostly, um, the, the data that were available for this were very sparse, so I had to fill in a lot of the gaps myself. Uh, it would be interesting to come back in 10 years and see how it all plays out, maybe do, uh, uh, do it for the period from 2030 to 2040 um, with a more data-driven approach. And then, although, we have a relatively clear picture of what people's plans are until 2030. Um, 
no one's really announced anything for the 2030 and beyond time period yet. And a lot of this is because I think that people are going to be waiting to see which of these projects succeed, how long they take, and how much they cost. Uh, so I do expect that we'll get a lot more of an, a lot more announcements in the next uh, five to ten years. Um, thank you for your time. And there are my sources. <laughs>